On the report of 24-year former superintendent for Rhode Island State Police Intelligence Unit, Colonel Brendan Daugherty, it is no secret that organized crime was prevalent in Rhode Island, and when Ray Patriarca was the boss, he ran all of New England from his chair out of the office on Atwell's Avenue. The Patriarca crime family Don Raymond Loreda Salvatore Patriarca, who went by El Patron instead of Don, respected and feared, ran his criminal enterprise even when he was doing time in prison. When it comes to the Mafia in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, the timeline can be divided into two eras, before and after Patriarca. Frank Morelli formed the original Providence crime family with his robbery gang and controlled bootlegging and gambling throughout Rhode Island, Connecticut, and Maine. They're also infamous for committing numerous robberies. Freight cars were a prime target for the Morelli brothers, and they were most likely responsible for a South Braintree robbery murder case that got two suspects named Seiko and Vanzetti convicted and executed. Boston crime family was headed by immigrant Gaspar Messina, who became a representante of the local Sicilian underworld. Messina was more of a businessman than he was a boss. While working at his wholesale grocery business in North End Boston called G. Messina and Co. Wholesale Grocery, he was partnered with Frank Shishera and Paolo Bagnata. Messina was elected the temporary Capo di Capi during the Castellamari's War until he retired again after settled down to become President Neptune Oil Corporation. East Boston mobster Filippo Pucola emerged and rose to be the young boss of Boston family and the gang competed over gambling, bootlegging, and loan sharking rackets, battling other ethnic gangs in Boston with consigliere Joseph Lombardo from North End. Lombardo arranged the South Boston's Irish Gustin game boss Frank Wallace's murder. Then Morelli and Bucola's clans merged, forming New England crime family in 1932. A one of Bucola's capos, Raymond Patriarca, came along to take Providence by storm, running his business known to his personal associates as The Office. Raymond Patriarca was born in Worcester, Massachusetts, and moved to Providence. At age three, he was a hood in his teens, and broke the law often after the death of his father, collecting seven charges, armed robbery, white slavery, hijacking, safe cracking, auto theft, and assault with deadly weapon. He increased in power gradually and notoriously. He became public enemy number one in 1938 and robbed the Brooklyn jewelry store and was convicted for armed robbery, only serving one month of his three to five year sentence. A Massachusetts governor councilman was impeached out of suspicion of mob ties as a result. He built more political influence and combined murder with his already lucrative operation and this brought Carlton O'Brien into his sights as O'Brien's power was getting out of hand so Patriarca arranged to have him whacked. The former head of the New England crime family Philip Bucola absconded out of America and gave full power to Patriarca. The office was a two story building called the Coinomatic Vending Machine Company on 168 Atwells Avenue in the heart of Providence and it was a front for the headquarters of the New England crime family. Nearly all the crime in Providence goes back to him. He was commonly seen in front of the building sitting in a lawn chair, smoking a cigar, wearing white socks, waving to people. Cops would wave to him and everyone knew he was watching everything. He was even a silent partner in Las Vegas his casinos with Frank Sinatra. Whitey Bulger had to kick up to Raymond Patriarca. If you break somebody's window, you have to ask Raymond Patriarca. In Providence, it is Raymond Patriarca's business. And in Raymond Patriarca's business, you don't get fired, you get fired at. Patriarca made early efforts to consolidate Boston and Providence's operations and develop strong alliances with the Genovese and Colombo families of New York. They competed for territory with Irish gangs in Boston, such as Winter Hill Gang, Charlestown Mob, 
and McLaughlin gang. Patriarcha had plenty of members, around 40 to 50 made guys and over 100 associates during its time. He allegedly ordered the murder of multiple Irish mobsters for interference with loan sharking operations in Boston. Patriarcha continued to expand his empire by the time 1956 came around. Every card game, prostitution ring, and illegal business in a Providence had to pay kickback to Patriarcha. Patriarcha's reign was so ruthless that in one incident, Il Patron allegedly ordered a longtime made man in the family to murder his own son after Patriarcha lost a considerable amount of money. The father pleaded for his son's life, but nothing changed until underboss Henry Tamilio persuaded Patriarcha to relent. Another account details how Patriarcha demanded that several members of the crime family give him $22,000 after the police got a hold of a shipment of stolen cigarettes he financed. He was even said to have put out a hit on his own brother for failing to notice a bug in his office. Trusted members who were made ran the different business ventures around their respective territories. In Boston's North End, the leading Italian-American group was the Angelo Brothers. All seven brothers were made, and their crew was dubbed In Town, referring to how one would have to go into town to visit the Angelo Brothers. As sworn members of the Patriarcha family, they were placed in charge of racketeering throughout Massachusetts until Irish mobs Winter Hill Gang and Charlestown Mob popped up their own local rackets in their neighborhoods. This is when Whitey Bulger, the Winter Hill Gang boss, informed on their Italian mob rivals by allowing the FBI to bug their headquarters. The bar Gennaro Jerry Angelo owned on Tremont Street in the early 80s. Most of the brothers were arrested on racketeering charges and held a decade. Jerry originally wanted to be a criminal lawyer but enlisted in the Navy during World War II and served four years in the Pacific achieving rank of Chief Boatswain's mate. When he completed his service, he had a regular table in the back room of an Italian diner called Francesca's Restaurant on North Washington Street. The Angelo brothers owned nightclubs and ran a large numbers game, offering special discounts for small business people to make bets on individual numbers. They built a huge network making these small businesses points of sales and bookie joints. This originally just attracted the interest of the mafia and this is where Angelo Brothers allowed the Patriarcha family to have a share as members of La Cosa Nostra. Jerry eventually became underboss of the Providence-based Patriarcha crime family. They ran their organization from 98 Prince Street in North End from the 60s to the 80s when Whitey Bulger and Stephen the Rifleman Flemmy drew a diagram of Jerry's bar for bug planting. That's when things went south. When Jerry was being taken in handcuffs from the restaurant, he yelled, I'll be back before my pork chops get cold. The cops had taped conversations about murder, gambling, and Shylock activities. In one conversation, Jerry ordered a hit on a bartender who was supposed to testify before a federal grand jury investigating gambling and loan sharking. The FBI prevented the hit. For eight months, Mobster often sarcastically wisecracked about evidence presented and was frequently reprimanded by District Court Judge David Nelson. He represented himself unsuccessfully and argued that he was framed by the FBI in Bulger. He died two years after parole in 2009. In March 2021, his son Jerry Jr. got charged with engaging in a payroll scheme at his towing company GJ Towing that defrauded the government of more than 3.3 million. But he is known in the community, donating generously to Little League and other sport communities in Metro Boston area, Revere, Lynn, and Nahant. There were most likely other crews that specialized in certain aspects of crime, and one of these was a major robbery extortion loan sharking group of 10 lower level Providence crime family members, including Gerard, John, and Walter We Met. The We Met faction is best known for the bonded vault heist, one of the biggest U.S. history, and was the longest and costliest criminal trial in Rhode Island history. According to retired Rhode Island State Police Colonel Brennan Daugherty, John's brother Gerard T. We Met was the one in charge of the We Met crew. 
a vassalage under Patriarcha's direction. Colonel Daugherty claimed John was always the gentleman, suave and debonair, that John preferred to resolve disputes with negotiations, in contrast to his more notorious, dangerous older brother Gerard. When the Wemets had their sights set on Hudson fur storage, it wasn't the fur coats they had in mind, though they were very popular in the 70s. The goal was a large vault that contained 146 large safe deposit boxes, and each box was two feet tall, two feet wide, and four or five feet deep. The boxes of valuables were a separate legal entity from the store called the Bonded Vault Company, and though it was used by members of the Patriarcha crime family and the heist was executed at request of Il Patron, the facility had a minimal security system that was thought to be unnecessary due to the reputation of the main customers and dwellers of the store. It happened around 8 a.m. on Thursday, August 14, 1975. Eight men traveling by van came to Hudson Fur Storage. The salt entered the business by front door, wearing a suit and glasses with the briefcase. He posed as a client, then pointed his 38 caliber revolver at co-owner Samuel Levine and warned the employees not to reach for any buttons or he would blow their head off. He got Levine to gather all the employees in an office and he put pillowcases over all their heads. Six of the other robbers entered and one stayed outside as lookout. The robbers start crowbarring the safe deposit boxes and filling their massive duffel bags with gold bars and loose gems. They had so many valuables that small bills like ones and fives were left all on the scene. The salt headed to Vegas and fell in love with the hooker that traveled around the country with her. The bonded vault crew was worried because Robert had a big mouth and was already desperate for money again. They had to send someone close to him so they sent his best friend Chucky Flynn to take him out. Chucky flew to Vegas and when he confronted DeSalt in a parking lot, DeSalt pointed a sawn-off shotgun at Chucky and forced him into his passenger seat. DeSalt keeps the shotgun fixed on his old friend as they talk about the good old days and begin to cry. And when Chucky Flynn persuaded Robert DeSalt to let him go, a guy named Joe Denise, a wise guy who flew with Chucky to make sure the hit on DeSalt went down, learned that DeSalt is still alive. He told Chucky, you're the stupidest motherfucker I've ever met in my life. And they flew back to Providence. This is where DeSalt's and by extension Chucky's luck ran out. FBI arrested Robert DeSalt in Las Vegas and it was a Rhode Island cop who came in to talk to Robert when he was informed that his friend Chucky Flynn is dead and he would be next. This was all a trick of course and Chucky was alive but DeSalt still sang like a canary. Robert gave up everyone who was involved in the robbery and so did Joe Denise. He betrayed Flynn and testified against him even though he promised he would always be loyal to Flynn. The trial ended and the three men were in prison, but everything didn't add up. It's said that each member of the heist had a take of only 64 grand each, so 20 to 30 million was stolen from the mob's own bank. The salt said when he went to the vault, it was a mega vault with a six foot thick door that was wide open. Only way that was possible was because the old man, the number one, Raymond Patriarcha, the boss of New England, allowed it. He even rescheduled the robbery at one point because his son, Raymond Jr., wanted to take his valuables out of the safe first. The rumors behind why he would rob his own crime family was while Il Patron was away in federal prison in Atlanta, he didn't feel like his soldiers were giving him his due and paying him enough. So he made a bold message to everyone that if you can't let the old man have some, then you will have none. A soldier from Angelo Brothers crew named Robert Donati, nicknamed Bobby D, was involved in a 500 million dollar art theft in Boston's Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in 1990. He had a brother named Richard who went by Dicky D. Bobby and Dicky D joined the ranks early in life and were mainly burglars. Bobby didn't begin until 1965. That same year he was convicted for armed robbery and sent to prison after he took cash in furs from Boylston Street Furrier. From then on his reputation grew increasingly popular as a well known organized crime figure. Bobby D befriended a rock musician and art thief Miles Connor Jr. 
in the early 70s. This friendship blossomed when they began to search through local antique shops scavenging for decor and furniture for their homes. The two were caught in 1974 trying to sell five paintings they stole from the Woolworth Estate in Monmouth, Maine. Another theft of a Rembrandt from Boston Museum of Fine Arts. While Connor was out on bail, in exchange for its return, Connor reduced his sentence. Bobby D served out his entire sentence, and when they were both free, they continued to plan heists. They frequently visited the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, as they had done since the 70s. Men of taste, they set their sights on specific works that they favored and knew would sell well. Bobby particularly was interested in a Napoleonic ornamental finial, while Connor was set on the famous oil painting, The Rape of Europa by Titian, and a bronze Shang Dynasty drinking vessel. Bobby D's level in the mob went up in the 80s as driver of Vincent the Animal Ferreira. The North End Boston crew leader that took over the Angelo brothers' operations because when his longtime bosses, the Angelos, were arrested and convicted on federal racketeering charges thanks to South End Boston, then Irish gangster Whitey Bulger helping the feds. Patriarcha family was feuding as Raymond Patriarcha Jr. was unable to unify the family behind him. Therefore, Whitey Bulger began to inform on them to the FBI in attempt to assert authority over Boston organized crime. When Cadillac Frank Selene got out of prison in 1989, Vincent the Animal Ferreira and other members feared that Cadillac Frank, a close confidant of Patriarcha Sr., would become Ray Jr.'s underboss. Animal attempted to have Cadillac Frank killed, but he survived the gunshot wounds. In the aftermath, Jr. attempted to bring peace back to the family, making one member each. This turned into an embarrassment as it was revealed that the FBI surveilled the entire ceremony with the listening device. This led to Ray Jr. stepping down at the behest of other families in the country, only giving more rise to the tension between the two factions. Evidence landed Ferreira in prison. All the while, Bobby D and his pal, Miles Connor Jr., were planning the heist of the century. The two art thieves went to leaks as far as climbing trees and timing the guards' movements through various galleries during after hours. Their tactic was to pose as police officers, which they had gotten away with on prior jobs using a package of uniforms that Donati acquired when they got the idea in a Revere bar they frequented. At 1 a.m. on March 18, 1990, the thieves disguised as cops convinced the security detail to let them enter, and they bound two men up and spent the next few hours taking 13 works of art, including Rembrandt's On These Seascapes, Storm on the Sea of Galilee, and the least valuable item of the score, an antique French finial that Bobby Dean had indicated an interest in, not to mention it was a hassle to remove the flagpole and the banner, so they went to great lengths getting it off. Struggling in front of a much more valuable and easier to remove Michelangelo original sketch that fortunately remains mounted today. The heist, however, was valued at 500 million, setting it as the biggest art theft of all time. Once the animal Ferreira became a guest of the government, Cadillac Frank Salam availed himself of the opportunity to step up as leader of the Patriot family. He still faced the challenge of Ferreira's crew and other Angelo loyalists in the North End. Both sides drew blood. In one account, a target was shot while changing a flat tire. The Patriarcha operatives reported to be in constant fear for their lives during this time. As in 2014, one told the Globe that two men showed up to their sister's home looking for him and he moved to the far north of New England living under an assumed identity. Donati was one of these anxious members of the family and he was noticeably less outgoing and more reclusive. He told his friend in August he noticed two men wearing black tracksuits near this house that he was renting on Mountain Avenue in Revere, and he believed they had been tracking his movements in preparation to take his life. As he left his house on September 21st, he was apparently abducted by a group of men and was found three days later in the trunk of his own Cadillac. Many other victims were found the same way, with the remains in the trunk of the vehicle they owned in life. This is a common mafia practice to indicate that the killing was related to the victim's criminal activities. It is a shame he died when he did because he was on the verge of being made, and killing a made man requires boss's approval. One of the more obscure crews was the North End Boston Zanino crew, led by Hilario Larry Bayon Zanino. Larry ran a juice loan business and gambling racket. They had a few run-ins with the Greek American mob, judging by the body. In the boss Larry's relative's pig farm, there was found James Brazos buried in 1980.
1954, Greek gangster Arthur Tosh Bratzos and his bodyguard Tommy D. the Prisco were also found stabbed and beaten on the outskirts of North End in the 60s. It's believed the two were shot because they were frantically shaking down the neighborhood to raise money for the Portuguese hitman Joseph the Animal Barbosa. One FBI informant reported that it started on November 15, 1966 when Joe Chico Amico, Tosh Bratzos, and Tommy D were bragging about coming close to the $85,000 of, of the $100,000 target goal to bail out Barboza, even displaying collected cash in the open. This is where Ralphie Chong grabbed a hold of Chico by the neck and unloaded numerous rounds into Bratzos with his gun and so began the executions. Amico miraculously survived the slaying, slipping free from La Matina's grip and slipping out the door. But only two months later, a bullet from East Boston button man Joe J.R. Russo would find him. The remains of Tosh and Tommy D were stuffed in Brazos Black Cadillac and abandoned in South Boston's Lower End neighborhood. Hours later, Ralphie and his mob buddy Johnny Chicotti were found mopping and scrubbing the late night cafe floor clean of blood when they arrived to question them. The bail money was intended for the forgetting the Portuguese Barboza out of jail was split between the participants on the winning side of the fall 1966 gangland purge. The Portuguese was a fearsome and vicious gangster with legend saying he had 30 killings. As a Boston member of Patriarca's crime family, he formed a gang at age 17 called the Cream Pie Bandits that launched a wave of terror over Boston in December 1949. His education came from Lyman Reform School, a building ground for violence where you had to be tough to get by. Let's say Joey Portuguese got an A plus with two bruised knuckles and a sweet nickname. He got started in East Boston and was a mainstay at a bar on Bennington Street and Brook Street Corner. For disturbing the peace one night, he slugged a cop and received a six month sentence. Shortly thereafter, he graduated from an expensive cooking school and then took a ride to the Orient on the SS President Wilson. He drove a black cutlass that was referred to by law enforcement as the James Bond car because it had an inventive alarm system and a button that pushed out thick black smoke from the tailpipe with the device. There was an incompatibility with his relationships though as he had connections with the Winter Hill Gang in part because James McLean was an ally of Vincent Fleming who was the rifle Fleming's brother. This and another situation caused the animal to lose his favorable role in the family as he was betrayed and got arrested. What happened was he had been shot at while standing outside his house in Chelsea and other unreported attempts apparently. This is partly because he was not abiding by traditions of La Cosa Nostra. One night he went into a nightclub that was already paying Jerry Angelo for protection and demanded that they make payments to him as well. Eventually he came to terms with his position on the totem pole and he became loquacious and spilled the beans to the feds. This led to the patriarchal figure of the family. Raymond Patriarca getting brought down to the penitentiary at Barboza a new identity when he enrolled in the witness protection program. Barboza was eventually shotgunned with four blasts later in the 70s outside of San Francisco apartments where he was living and hiding under a secret identity. He had a 38 on him but he didn't get the chance to pull. His funeral was in Portuguese. His attorney said, with all due respect to my former client, I don't think society has suffered great loss. Capo Elario Zanino was overheard on a bug saying about the supposed hitman who took out the animal, J.R. Russo. Larry Bone describes he was a genius with a carbine. J.R. Russo was also known to have taken out the straggler that got away from the nightlight cafe. Chico Amico. Steve the Rifleman was no angel either. He was an informant undercover for years. While married to his wife Jeanette, he went to lengths as far as killing his Gumar when she found out that he had been talking to the police. Cautious about the cat leaving the bag, this specific victim was Deborah Davis, and they had been dating for seven years along with her sister, Michelle Davis, while he was already engaging in clandestine affairs with mother and stepdaughter Marion and Deborah Hussey, and longtime mistress Marilyn Da Silva, to name a few. After Deborah was closing in on breaking up with Flemmy and getting ready to tell her mother about their relationship, Steve killed his stepdaughter with a grope wire and buried her in South Boston 
inside a basement. He got Whitey Bulger and Kevin Weeks to help lure Deborah into the house initially. According to Weeks, Stevie said he'd take care of the clothes and the teeth. He was all business, going about the task of cleaning up and pulling teeth, even though he had a long-term relationship with Debbie. This wasn't bothering him any more than it had bothered Jimmy. Stevie was actually enjoying it, the way he always enjoyed a good murder. Like a stockbroker going to work, he was just doing his job, cold and relaxed, with no emotion or change in his demeanor, he was performing a night's work. Whether he then went out to meet another of his girlfriends or went home to marry him, I have no idea. It's said that both Steve Flemmy and Whitey Bulger would get underage girls as young as 13, hooked on heroin, and sexually exploit them for years. Steve Flemmy and Larry Bione were longtime friends, bouncing together since the late 1930s in South Boston in Larry Bione's high school yearbook. Hilario expressed that he wanted to go to medical school, so his classmates called him Zip. He allegedly stabbed a window waiter to death in a South End restaurant for slow service. He had his apartment broken into and bugged with court approval later in life, and was heard explaining how dangerous it is to kill just one member of the Winter Hill Gang to patriarchal family soldier John Chicotti. They both complained to each other. If you're clipping people, Zanino said, I always say make sure you clip the people around them first. Get them together because everybody's got a friend. He could be the dirtiest motherfucker in the world, but someone that likes this guy, that's the guy that sneaks you. Chicotti replied, They don't have the scruples that we have. Zanino agreed. You know how I knew they weren't Italiano? When they bombed the fucking house. We don't do that. Ching Chong Lamadino was a veteran soldier to Capo Larry Bioni. As owner of the popular After Hours Social Club Nightlife Cafe, he got his nickname for the eyes that his friend claimed to make him look Asian. Ralphie Chong spent only two years as an accessory after the fact and did another five years in the feds for racketeer. After these charges, he didn't want to serve any more time. He bailed to Florida when he was busted in 1984 on RICO charges. He then goes to Italy before finally come back home to custody in the mid-90s after being gone for a decade. Decade. Authorities accused South Florida restaurant owner and wise guy Richard Dick Kami Kamalucci of harboring and aiding Lamadina's run from the law in the 80s. Charged for allegedly helping Ralphie Chong acquire fake driver's license and passport, Dick Kami had actor Wilfred Brimley from John Carpenter's The Thing testify as a character witness at his trial and was found not guilty. Dick Kami's father-in-law was Johnny Photo, a Genovese button man in Miami who once owned the iconic Peppermint Lounge in New York on West 45th. Also, Joe Black Lamadina was caught saying, we clipped them, nine guys, tied them up and put them in the trunk. Don't say nothing more about it. This was a phone call detailing Ching Chong on how the executions went in 81. Joe Black. Ching Chong's younger brother died of natural causes two years later in 1983. Antonino got promoted to consigliere when Ralphie Chong went on the lam for Florida away from his charges. And Jerry Angelo, longtime New England Mafia underboss, ordered the murder of Angelo Patrizzi, who got away from Ralphie Ching Chamatina back when Ralphie clipped Brazos and Prisco. The Angelo brothers were the face of the Massachusetts Italian mob for more than 20 years, looking after the Boston wing of the crime family on behalf of Raymond Patriarcha Sr., the legendary New England Don, who passed away while under indictment for a pair of murders. After Raymond's death from heart attack in 1984, underboss Gennaro Jerry Angelo Sr. wasn't considered boss material, so Raymond Patriarcha's son, Raymond Jr., was installed as boss. Thanks to the family's top lieutenant, Ilario Larry Zanino, and the Gambino crime family for backing Junior, which led to the National Commission granting approval of the ascendancy, and his position was confirmed. Angelo was demoted, and Zanino was made consigliere, as said before. This is until Ray Jr. embarrassed himself when the Fed recorded damaging pieces of evidence and matched Ray Jr.'s voice to a radio interview, and then William Grosso of New Haven. Connecticut held power for the New England family. Grosso was known for his ruthlessness during the stints to 30 years in 1987. Grosso died in 1989, but when he got murdered by a Genovese connected in Springfield gangster, the next to be boss was Nicholas Bianco, who had a ton of experience in New York with the Profaci Colombo family, as well as New England Underworlds. One month later, the promising Bianco got sentenced to 11 years and nine other members were put behind bars as well thanks to 
Ray Jr. setting up an initiation with the feds practically in front row seats. The family was then after led by Cadillac Frank Salam after the trials and moved shop back to Boston. Then in 1999, Salam was sentenced to 11 years. He testified against Flemmy and Bulger in 2001. The New England mob has recently been hit with several RICO indictments because two capos turned witness. The next boss was Luigi Manoggio and he stepped down in 2009 when the FBI investigated two strip clubs, Cadillac Lounge and Satin Doll. Manoggio was pled guilty and was sentenced for extorting the two strip clubs in 2012. Anthony D'Annunzio was the acting boss in 2009 and he continued to extort strip clubs in Rhode Island with Gambino crime family members. He pled guilty to shaking down the clubs and got six years in 2012. In 2014, acting boss Antonio Spucky Spagnolo was arrested with reputed made man Price Stretch Quintina for extorting a video poker machine company that installs machines for illegal gambling in bars and social clubs. Spucky and Stretch are reportedly old members of the Patriarch of Boston faction. In 2015, Peter Lamoni headed the family and, and his underboss Matthew Goodlooking Matty Gugliamatti of, of Cranston, Rhode Island. Next in line was Carmen, the Big Cheese Denunzio of East Boston, but consigliere Anthony Ponytail Tony Perillo was also getting looked at for the role. Ultimately, the Big Cheese took over and Goodlooking Matty remains in consigliere. The underboss is currently unknown. Raymond Patriarcha was the acting leader of the New England crime family for most of the 20th century, and he led the underground crime community to the pinnacle of its success in New England. But after his time, no one could achieve even close to what he did. As a testimony to his greatness, displays a lack of organized crime in the area where his territories were placed, and a major decline in revenue was immediately apparent when he stepped down. He had an innate ability to gain others' trust and exemplifying leadership that apparently cannot be emulated. Raymond Patriarcha was indicted 28 times, convicted 7 times, arrested 4 times, and served 11 years in the big house. His legend lives on today as most of Providence would agree that the city was a safer, better place when Il Patron had the throne.